Matthew chapter 24. Unless the Lord deems otherwise, I'm going to try and be gentle with my voice this morning. I've got a pretty bad cold that, uh, you know, we have a funny expression. I caught a cold. Why in the world would you go catch a cold? No, the cold caught you. And the cold caught me. So uh, I'm a bit of a more of a bass than baritone this morning. What a wonderful uh, Christmas season this has been. What a blessing. Thank you all to all who uh, shared expressions of joy or uh, blessing and uh, gifts and so forth. Thank you so much. It's, it's, uh, it's a privilege and honor to be able to uh, teach here every Sunday morning, to pastor this church, to get involved in the lives of each one of you as God determines genuinely truly from the bottom of my heart i'm saying it's it's an honor and a privilege far beyond what i could ever have imagined or thought and uh i don't take that blessing lightly so thank you and happy new year last night i uh, uh woke up to the sound of someone outside our bedroom window banging on a pan <laughs> and I looked at my watch and recognized, hmm, it's New Year's. Hmm, how about that? <laughs> but it's become this significant thing, hasn't it? And I, I don't know if it's as true as it was when I was younger. But when I was younger, there was some seriousness to the whole concept of New Year's resolutions. I'm resolving to be different or do something different in the year ahead. Today, as I listen to the world's voice and so forth, the main thing I hear is New Year's resolutions are all related to how many pounds to take off in the year ahead. That's kind of the, the primary one I hear. Um, so I'm not sure that uh, any of you or people in general are still into this New Year's resolutions, but I can remember as a kid, people would make a list of them. They didn't just have a New Year's resolution. They had their list of New Year's resolutions and, you know, went through it. I, I never really did that. I saw everybody else doing it. I tried a couple times. I'm really bad at it, so I just quit. But... Turning the page into a new year does bring us to the fact of considering what's ahead. What's ahead? 2016, okay, it's over. You're still going to write it a few times in the next couple of weeks, <laughs> but it's over. It doesn't count anymore. And we think, okay, 2016, boy, lots of stuff happened. Don't want to go there. 2017, what's ahead? What's ahead? And so perhaps you have resolved to do something different. I hope it is resolution as Dave encouraged us and admonished us this morning to seek after the Lord in a deeper and stronger way in 2017. That's a great New Year's resolution. That's a good everyday resolution. But I thought this morning in the spirit of looking ahead, not just for looking ahead of what's going to happen in 2017 or in the days ahead or in your life, but to look ahead so that we can put the context of perhaps your New Year's resolutions that you have already made or that you're considering to make in the context of what's ahead in tonal, total. What's ahead in total? And to remind you of these things, as Peter said. So if you found your way to Matthew chapter 24, we're going to pick it up in verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. 
Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Let's stop right there for a minute. (coughs) Context. In the last few verses, Jesus has been teaching in the temple precincts. He has challenged, admonished, and pointed a finger at the religious leaders of the day who were trying to trick him, you know, had different people come, a different consortium of groups that didn't really agree with each other, but decided to band together to try and trick Jesus and fool him into saying something that the people would not then follow him anymore. And they failed. And finally, there's a statement that's amazing in there. It says, after he finally spoke to him, no one dared ask him another question, it says. He just blew their minds without even thinking twice about it. Come on now, you're talking about the Lord God Almighty in flesh. Who can challenge him? Who can stand against him? No one. And so after that, he gives some stinging words to the Pharisees and to the scribes and to others. And in the last part of Matthew chapter 23, notice what it says in verse 36 says, Assuredly, I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. But you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And of course, there were no chapter and verses in the original manuscripts of this. And immediately after that, Matthew records for us, then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. I see something more than just, oh, he left that particular place in this because he just said he just said Jerusalem you're the one you're the one who kills the prophets the ones that I send to you to speak my word to to warn you and to encourage you and comfort you and all of those things and you choose to kill them and stone them oh how often I've wanted to gather you together like a hen gathers her chicks Now, i got to be honest with you. I have never seen a hen gather her chicks. I didn't grow up on a farm. I grew up in the suburbs. But that image is very, very close. I've watched the mother hen of our household, Krista, as we have raised our children, and I saw many times her gather her chicks to herself when they were young and they were hurt there was something going on and I have seen now in my children and grandchildren the gathering together you know what I'm talking about you know what Jesus is talking about here and here is this huge dichotomy of what we at one time or maybe even to some degree today think but certainly a dichotomy in what the world thinks and what is true The world thinks what we sometimes think is God sends his prophets and his messengers to warn us in the finger wagging of uh, if you don't shape up and fly right, I'm quoting my mother, then this is going to happen to you. But Jesus says what the sense of sending all those who did say a lot of that stuff, just like my mom did, but the heart of God was... I want to gather you together. I want to pull you in to protect you. But you were not willing. And so you won't see me anymore until you say, now he's speaking to the leadership of the Jews, and to the people of Jews, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, of course, they saw him. There were Jews who physically saw him. The disciples were Jews, and they saw it risen. 
But he is speaking as the Messiah. You will not see the Messiah. You will not see the Holy One of Israel that you have uh, rejected. You will not see the Messiah to lead you until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is going to happen in the future. hasn't happened yet. And then it says, He went out and departed. There's two words there. He went out and he departed. That's a powerful statement. That isn't just Jesus walked out in, across the Kidron Valley and up into the Mount of Olives. Jesus departed from the temple. There's a similar kind of imagery and, and reality that happened uh, in the time of uh, just before the Babylonian captivity and the destruction of the, of the temple in Jerusalem, the first temple, Solomon's temple. And Ezekiel saw it, and he saw the Spirit of the Lord depart from the temple. And that's the sense that I get from this. Jesus departed the temple, and it was about a little less than 40 years later from this event that the temple itself was totally destroyed as Jesus prophesies here in just the next couple of verses. He departed and he went out. And the disciples came to show him the buildings of the temple. Now let me tell you something about Herod's temple, which uh, is the, the model. That's actually a pretty large model that somebody built of uh, what Herod's temple would have looked like during or what they conceive it looked like. Uh, during Jesus' time, it was huge. There were the the Jews talk about two temples, and they talk about the first temple period and the second temple period, and so forth. Well, there are actually technically three temples. Uh, the first was built by Solomon. Remember, David gathered all the stuff together, but Solomon was the one who actually built it, and it was marvelous and amazing, and it was destroyed when the Jews were overrun by the Babylonians, and the Babylonians first sacked the temple, and then in their last and most horrible overrunning of Jerusalem, according to God's plan and in judgment of Israel, they leveled it. They totally destroyed it. Then, uh, when the Jews came back to Jerusalem, uh, they rebuilt what's usually referred to as Zerubbabel's temple, but it was a much smaller temple. This was just a small group of the people from Israel who had been taken captive who came and said, yes, we will rebuild the temple. And they built something that was so small that those who remembered the former temple wept when this temple was completed and dedicated. You know, that wasn't a time to weep, that was a time to celebrate. But they were weeping because they remembered the glory of the old temple. And that temple lasted until about, uh, I think it's 19 or 16 B.C. is when Herod decided. Herod was uh, appointed by the Romans and uh, empowered by the Romans and uh, to reign over Jerusalem and Judea. And he uh, was quite a builder. You go to Jerusalem, you go to Israel today, and you will find uh, ruins today of various building projects that Herod the Great uh, went forth on. And one of them was to build, rebuild, or kind of... Well, I remember when I was a kid, near my house, very near, there was this little dive bar next to a driving range. I actually used to go there when I was a little kid because back in those days, as a little kid, you could walk into a bar and buy some food and, and leave. You didn't have to be with an adult, or at least they let me do that. But it was a dive. I recognized when I got older, man, this place is a dive. And then they got a building permit up there in the North Hills in McCandless where it's tough to do stuff like that to get it exactly right. They got a building permit to remodel this bar. And what they did was they built another bar around it, leaving the first one intact until the second building was complete, and then they demolished the first. And somehow that was remodeling instead of rebuilding. 
And so they were able to get the building permit and so forth. That's almost the concept you've got to think about in terms of how small Zerubbabel's temple was and how enormous and ornate Herod's temple was. It was phenomenal. It was so filled with gold on the outside at the top of the relief area, they said that when the sun shone on it, the reflection was so bright it would blind you. It had marble and white limestone as all the rocks and, and, and blocks in it, and the blocks were huge, some of them weighing as much as 162 tons. Enormous. And they were shaped and cut so perfectly that no mortar was used in the temple. It was said you, could, you couldn't stick your penknife, of course they didn't say penknife in those days, but you couldn't stick your penknife between the stones of the temple. It was cut so perfectly well together and so covered with uh, gold and precious, beautiful things. Herod started it in 19 or 16 uh, BC. It technically wasn't complete until 63 AD, long after Herod's death, but they continued the building program according to his design, which was just seven years before it was destroyed by the Romans because of a, revo a, a revolt by the, by the Jews of the day. It was amazing. So when... Uh, when the disciples came and said, Jesus, look at this beautiful temple, it could imagine it absolutely, them saying that. But I want you to think about something, and that's why I named this message what I did. Jesus says in verse 2, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, depending upon your version, interpretation of the Bible, it might say, don't you see these things? Or it might even say, do you see these things? That last one is an incorrect translation because the word not is in there. It's in the original language. Do you not see all these things? And I don't think Jesus was saying, do you not see all these things? That's what the disciples were already looking at. That's what they were seeing and wanting to show to Jesus. But Jesus wanted, to see, wanted them to see something much bigger than this amazing building dedicated unto the Lord, built according to all of the uh, dimensions and the, to allow for all of the services and ministries and sacrifices that are ordained in the Word of God to take place in a beautiful, wonderful, seemingly impenetrable place. Man, this is great. God, look at what has been built for the Lord. And Jesus says, don't you see all these things? All what things? All the things he'd been talking about? All the things that had just happened in the last few days, in the last days of his earthly ministry? Don't you see all these things? Don't you? This? This? One stone's not going to be left upon another that's not thrown down. Imagine what the disciples are thinking at that moment. Here's this edifice that in their mind sure there's some problem there's some corruption yeah we got to clean it out and jesus clean it out a couple times and man we're really going to clean it and let this be a place that is glorifying god and jesus says no nah, no nah, it's 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 toast it's done i knew a knew a saint in a in a church went to when chris and i first moved to pittsburgh and we were church shopping and we went to this one church for, for quite a while, and there was, there was a guy in there who was a church that where there would be utterances during the, the regular normal service and so forth. And this guy had this interesting voice. He was a big guy and this big, deep, breathy voice, kind of like what I am today. <laughs> and he would talk like this. And every sentence was like this. And he would share something like this. 
And, the, and one of his favorite expressions was, and it came to pass. <laughs> All that you see came to pass. See, he wasn't just saying, and this happened. He was saying, all that you see around you, just as Jesus just did, this all came to pass. If the Lord should delay his return, who knows what this building, if it exists in a hundred years, will be used for or be like. Perhaps it will continue to be a church. Perhaps your children and grandchildren and mine will be worshiping Jesus here. Or perhaps it'll be something else. Or perhaps it'll be leveled and who knows. All of these things that seem so sturdy and solid to us, they're temporary. They're for but a moment. They are, well, the scripture describes it as just like a, a breeze that blows through as the flowers of the field that rise up one day and are gone the next. And that's kind of unsettling to us, isn't it? Especially here in Pittsburgh. You know, we not only gauge ourselves by the things physically that we see around us, it's how we get to where we want to go, isn't it? Isn't that how directions happen? Go down the street to where the Wendy's is. Turn left right there at the, at the place where the giant eagle used to be, but they tore it down. It's by these things that were there. We even find our directions that way by the things around us. And Jesus says, no, think bigger than that. Think bigger than that. And so this morning, I want you to think bigger than just 2017. I want you to think about and consider what we will see in Matthew 24. And then bring 2017 and January 1st and 2nd and 3rd into that. Okay? So here we go. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples privately asked him three questions. Tell us, number one, when will these things be? Number two, what will be the sign of your coming? And number three, related to number two, and what will be the sign of the end of the age? They, Jesus just told them the temple would be destroyed. They put it together in their minds that that must be the end of the age because the temple in Jerusalem is so important to the Jews. And uh, this, this must be the sign of when you will come and declare yourself to be Messiah and King. And Jesus answered and said to them, and he answers the second and third question before the first. Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Now, Jesus is talking in the context of the whole scriptures that we know in comparing scripture to scripture in the full revelation of God. Jesus right here is describing what will happen between his death and resurrection and the beginning of what's known as the Great Tribulation or the just before that, the parousa of the church, the gathering up, the rapture of the church to be with the Lord. So we are in this time period. And, you know, Jesus is talking physically in this time to his disciples, but Matthew is writing this down some 20 or 30 years later so that we all could know this even today. And so today, these words are spoken to us in the world that we live in today. And, well, yeah, pastor, yeah, all this stuff is happening. I could go home, and if the paper came today, but it didn't, it came yesterday, but it looked like the Sunday paper, and I was very confused. And you open it up, and you could find just about every one of these things Jesus describes in the paper today and tomorrow or turn on CNN, or turn on MSNBC, or Fox News, or do whatever you do to get the news however you get it, and you can find every one of these things, right? And how many times have 
people in the world said, I, I can remember when uh, the first desert war in the Mideast took place. I remember that. I was going to school at night at the time when uh, the buildup stopped and they actually started bombing and, and the professor canceled class because everybody in the class was so upset about it. And I remember people talking about, you know, is this the end? Is this the end? It's the Middle East. There's this big war in the Middle East. Is this, a, you know, and then the news gets the word Armageddon because that gets people's attention and sells whatever they're selling on their newscast and you know could this be the armageddon no no and all you have to do is read matthew chapter 24 to find out not just right here but through the whole thing as we will see no and notice what jesus says in the midst of this see that you are not troubled there will be false religion and deception don't be troubled. Many will come in my name, and many will be deceived because of that. Don't be troubled. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. There will be famine, pestilence, all this stuff. Don't worry about it. And he uses an expression that's quite interesting here. Verse 8, he says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. This is an expression that's used to talk about when a woman first begins to go into labor. And in another, in another place, in other translations, it, it even uses the term. These are just the beginning of the birth pangs. It's very interesting to me because, number one, okay, I can tell you, at least with number one child, I got into a semi-panic when, you know, the pains started. And we had gone to Lamaze classes and we had all this stuff. You were supposed to have a, a goodie bag there with all the stuff to be ready. And you're supposed to have a bag because you see there were not cell phones or even mobile phones in those days. So you needed to have money to put into a phone, public phone, to make a phone call to talk to people. So you needed to have lots of quarters, especially if you had to call from Albuquerque, New Mexico, to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, which to tell my family, or to California to tell Krista's family. So, okay, I'm supposed to have all this stuff. You know, okay. Well, we procrastinate. I procrastinated. And so at two o'clock in the morning, when it was its time, I got up, in a panic, threw all this stuff in a bag. Krista worked um, at a hotel and uh, got tips a lot. So she had a big jar full of coins. We just took that thing and dumped it in the goodie bag. It was like about eight pounds of nickels, dimes, quarters, and pennies. You know, okay, we're ready. we gotta go, you know. I remember driving down the highway because we had this long highway to get to the hospital and I'm driving like crazy in this big blue Ford panel van that we had at the time and I'm just going like crazy and she's going, you know, we have time, it's all right. I, said, I know, but this is the only time I'm going to be able to say to the cop when he pulls me over, my wife is having a baby. And that's not unusual behavior, and it's not unusual behavior for human beings to see the wars and rumors of wars and the famines and the pestilences and the deceptions and all of this and start to get in a panic, which is why, again, Jesus says, don't let your heart be troubled. And I say to you this morning, don't let your heart be troubled. It's easy to get so wrapped up into the bad news that is broadcast 24-7 into your home by multiple commentators. And the world is pulling that in and they have no hope. You have what the scripture describes as a blessed hope. It's not just a hope. It's a blessed hope. Let not your heart be troubled. Jesus said in the Gospel of John, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My, my Father's house, many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you so that when I come again, I can gather you together, take you to be where I am. That's where our hope 
and where we can rest in that. And by the way, it's just the beginning of the birth pangs. Now the interesting thing is, for all of us who know anything about birth, those things start getting closer and closer together the closer it comes to birthing time. And I wonder if the choice of this word is prophetic in the sense that, you know what, it seems like wars are happening more often and all these things are happening more often, like the baby's coming. The Lord is coming. Maybe. I wouldn't, I wouldn't take that too far, but it's quite an interesting thing to consider. Okay, next. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations. And then the end will come. Remember they asked, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Well, the gospel needs to be preached in all the world. And there are some ministries that have grabbed hold of this concept. There's a, there was a ministry down in Florida for a while. The, the radio ministry was called uh, Until the Whole World Hears. And, you know, it's a, one, it's a wonderful thing. And yes, we are called to preach the gospel until all the world hears. But you know what? It's, it's not entirely dependent upon us because uh, if you read the book of Revelation, you've got the, uh, uh, you've got the evangelist angels who will fly through the air and make sure everybody knows. But we are called to do this. But there is this sense that the gospel will reach all the ends of the earth. Well, it is quite interesting today, isn't it, that um, this very broadcast has the potential, we're not broadcasting this very um, recording that gets posted up on our YouTube channel, has the potential to be watched by anyone in the world who's connected to the internet. Anyone. Interesting. There have been missionaries into all of the world, into the farthest reaches of the world. Have they reached every square inch of the territory of the earth? I don't know, but pretty close, I think. So it's quite interesting to think about that in consideration of when will the end come? But the first part of it is what Jesus really wants us to pay attention to. Because later he's, he, he will explain to everybody, hey, nobody knows the hour of the day, so stop trying to figure it out. But he said all this to say, look, tribulation, in the, in the uh, phrasing of this in the Greek, there's actually an idea of a personification of tribulation. You will be turned over to tribulation as if tribulation were some person or thing or authority. You will be given over to tribulation. Not, eh, hey, you'll, you'll, you'll be tribulated against for a while. No, you will be given over to tribulation. Now, who do you belong to? That's a question. Who do you belong to? Jesus Christ. Yeah. So who has the authority to turn you over to tribulation? Ooh, pastor, I don't like the idea of that at all. Neither do I. There's nothing in this world and in your life experience that is not father-filtered. You are entirely within his control. Entirely. So if we are called to face tribulation, it's because God has ordained that the best thing for you and for the kingdom of God is for you to endure tribulation. But we, like a spoiled kid, say, but I don't want to. I don't want to have tribulation, Lord. I don't want to do that. Gosh, I saw my grandson for the first time. I'd never seen it to this extent. 
you know, this we've had cousins together and everything for the last two weeks. The other night, it was it was time to leave, um, and uh, boy, he didn't want to, and he just instantly and crying, and I don't want to leave, like he was being asked to walk on hot coals or something. <laughs> I went, but both Chris and I kind of went, wow, never seen him react to that extent. He was tired and just, you know. But that's me sometimes. When I see what the Lord lays out before me and says, look, this is, this is what I have for you. I don't want that. Right? But what else has he promised us? To never, never leave us. Never forsake us. Never leave us to our own situation to handle it on our own. Never. And in the Greek, that means never. Ever. <laughs> Verse 15. Here it comes. The answer to the second question. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let, the, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. Let him who's in the field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your f flight might not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be a great tribulation such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor shall ever be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I've told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, don't go out. Look, he's in the inner rooms, don't believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. All right, first of all, verse 28. I don't know. There's lots of different, there's lots of different ideas on what it means in context or it's an expression or something. We're just not going to waste our time there because it's, I don't know. Really, it's, it's one of those really hard verses of the Bible. If you want to talk about it later, we can hang out and talk about it. I have some ideas, but I don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on the rest of what it says here. That's just his concluding statement, kind of taking what I believe is a, is a local expression and using it in a way that really the application is kind of bizarre. But the main point of it is, look, there will be a great tribulation like there has never ever been in the history of creation. So those who look at this passage of Scripture and say, oh, well, this all happened in AD 70 when the Romans came in and wiped out Jerusalem and threw one stone down upon another and a million and a half Jews were massacred, burned alive, and all this. I'm sorry, as horrible as that is, more horrible things have happened than that. And Jesus said, Nothing will be as horrible. Nothing will be a tribulation like this, the great tribulation. And flip over to the right to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. For some reason, I always feel like Sylvester the Pussycat when I say Thessalonians. God help me. Why did I even say that? Chapter 2, verse 1, 2 Thessalonians. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Here it comes. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God 
in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's the abomination that causes desolation. If you go back to uh, the book of Daniel and look at this reference and walk through it and you look at the uh, early types of it, the early pictures of it in uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, the, the Greek king who sacrificed a pig on the altar in the temple in Jerusalem, which helped to initiate the Maccabean Revolution and the celebration that the Jews are in right now called Hanukkah, which is the, the celebration of the rededication of that temple after that happened. And if you go to the book of Revelation and you read through it, you will find that this is talking about the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast. The, you call him who you will, but he is the one who will come and be totally infused and possessed by the spirit of Antichrist, of Satan himself, and seek to deceive many. And after deceiving many, at one point he will come and he will declare himself to be God in the temple of God in Jerusalem. Well now, that points out something to us that needs to happen before the Lord comes. And that is that the temple of the Jews in Jerusalem will be rebuilt. It will. It, 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 the temple will exist. Now, you look at the world today, you, go, <laughs> could, you want to talk about war in the Middle East. Let's let the Jews try and establish a temple on, the, on what's known as the Temple Mount today. Agree? Agree. But it will happen. And there are Jews that are preparing for that, have been preparing since they entered the new, since they re entered the land in 1948, even before that. The things like the Temple Institute, if you go out on that, templeinstitute.org, and you'll, you'll see some of the stuff they're doing, and that they are already making the instruments for the sacrifice and so forth. It's amazing. There, there will be a temple and, and will come. But the key is that. This hasn't happened yet, but here's the sign. Here's the sign of the coming of the Lord. They ask, what will be the sign of your coming? Okay, when you see the abomination of desolation. But here's the good news. The good news is that according to the timeline of the future, the church will be captured away and will not see this. But wait a minute, Pastor. What about all these elect people who the Great Tribulation is shortened so that they're not destroyed? Yeah. Well, you know, there are people that have heard the gospel, will have heard, if the Lord comes today, there are people who have heard the gospel, there are people that have sat in this church, in other churches, who are not believers or followers of the Lord Jesus, but they've heard about it. And then they're going to see what happens where hundreds of millions, a couple billion, I don't know how many believers there are in the world today. If the Lord came today and gathered us all together, they would go, I heard something about this. I remember. I remember. It's one of the reasons that we started making uh, stuff and put it out on the internet and why back in the day when Pastor Chuck first started it, he said, hey, you know what? When, when it all happens and we're gone, there are going to be libraries and libraries of videos and sermons that people could access on the internet, download, and they'll hear it again and they'll be able to be ministered to. That's the sign. That's the sign. Verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, the powers of heaven will be shaken. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they'll gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. 
So at, that's at the end of the Great Tribulation, and it's described in Revelation chapter 19, I believe it is. And this is to, to uh, gather together the elect who have been saved during the Great Tribulation period, and especially the Great Tribulation period is for the Jews. It's the last week in the 70 weeks prophecy of Daniel. It's the 70th week, which is missing, has not happened yet. But the point I want to make is that the sign of the coming of the Son of Man from lightning from east to west, everyone will see it. No one can miss it. Now, I don't think it's as true today as it was when I was first saved. And, and earlier in the, in the 20th century, there were a lot of people who preached that the Lord had come already. And only the secret people who had the knowledge would know that. And it's a heresy that dates back to the first century of the church and the Gnostics and the secret knowledge and so forth. No. Well, does, doesn't it say that he'll come like a thief in the night? Well, here's the thing. There are actually two comings that we are awaiting as believers in Jesus Christ for Jesus. Two, two comings. The first one is where he will call to us from heaven to be gathered up to be with him as the church. That will be before the great tribulation begins. The second one is when he will gather us from heaven to ride with him back down to the earth to declare the earth his and to end this age and begin the next. That first one, yeah, it's going to be a surprise to everybody. It could happen before I finish this message. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. The other has been talked about, told about, is described in great detail in the Scriptures, Old Testament and New Testament, so that there will be no mistaking it. There can be no mistaking it. Now learn this parable from the fig tree. When its branch has already become tender, puts forth its leaves, you know summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things, know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Now the rest of this chapter and the whole of chapter 25 or about being ready. Be ready. Keep oil in your lamps. Be ready. Don't be out just carousing and doing whatever you want, thinking, ah, I got time. I got time. No one knows the hour of the day, so don't try and figure it out. Don't waste your time. Use your time more wisely. Now, when I first became a Christian, one of the, one of the things that was instrumental in my being led to the Lord was the book by Hal Lindsey, The Late Great Planet Earth. Um, and it, it, for the first time in my experience, put the headlines of the day, and, and the day was uh, in 1975, um, those days, the headlines of those days in light of biblical prophecy. And went, Whoa, and man, especially the establishing of the nation of Israel, which didn't exist uh, for millennia until 1948, 49 48. Um, you know, that's why a lot, of the, a lot of the prophetic interpretation of the church was trying to figure out how the, all these things could be without a temple, without a nation of Israel and all this stuff. And they came up with lots of ideas, but then God blew them all away by reestablishing the nation of Israel. As he will blow everybody away with the reestablishing of a temple in Jerusalem, all of these things. But in that day, there was this concept that, okay, fig tree. Okay, fig tree is used as nation of Israel a lot of times throughout the scripture. So what he's talking about here is the fig tree represents Israel. And okay, the fig tree, is, it's been planted again. It's growing. And this generation, what generation? The generation that was alive when the, 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 the state of Israel was, was reestablished. Man, the Lord's common by 1988 because 40 years is a generation it didn't happen 
right? And there have been lots of other ideas. What does this generation mean, this generation? I believe that what this generation is talking about is within the context of what was just being talked about, the generation that lives through the Great Tribulation. There's an end to the Great Tribulation. I ended it sooner than, than I could have for the sake of the elect. And be assured, this generation that goes through the Tribulation period, I will come. That's how the Great Tribulation went. That's how I interpret that. But again, if we get caught up in that, we're actually getting caught up in that. Well, when's he coming? When's he coming? Here's all we need to know. We need to be able to look at the signs of the times. In the same way that we look at a tree and go, man, spring is coming. You won't find a tree out there today that will tell you that. But you will in a couple months. And every year, it's exciting, isn't it? It's happening again. Warmth. That's what we look for. And all these things that he said would be the beginning of sorrows. You know what? They're all still here. And when you look at the practicalities of things that need to happen in order for the things that are prophesied to happen, I think Dave used the expression, the stage is being built. The stage is being set. I think the stage is built already. Now it's being set. Now the pieces are in place. Even in my lifetime, the concept of worldwide currency that could be controlled, that you couldn't buy or sell unless you had a number, I don't know how that's going to work. Well, now I do. It's already working. It's already, it's already working. How will they see, how could they see in Jerusalem the, the, the two witnesses all around the entire world at the same time? Well, you know what? Go watch it on YouTube if YouTube is still around. Right? So many things are being set in place in the details. Jesus prophesied what seemed impossible to the disciples. He said, see this magnificent building? Built by the Romans who rule the world right now, so who's going who's gonna to fight against them and take this thing down? i tell you the truth, not one stone left on another. It was literally um, fulfilled when uh, Titus and his armies surrounded Jerusalem and the Jews uh, gathered into the temple believing that they would be safe in the temple. So the, the, the time period, you read the history of the, of the uh, siege of Jerusalem and it's horrible. I mean, the famine, pestilence, um, cannibalism, uh, just horrors committed on both sides, both Jews and, and Romans. Just terrible, terrible times. And in the end, they all gathered into the temple as their last standing part, and a soldier threw a torch through one of the open windows that initiated a fire because, of course, the inside was, was all wood, initiated a fire that burnt, that caught so quickly and burned so hot that it, that it literally melted all of the gold that was at the top of the temple, and it seeped down into those cracks between all of the stones. And so once the temple was destroyed, the Jews were taken care of, then um, they began systematically tearing down the temple stone by stone to get at the gold that had seeped in between the cracks. Amazing. No, it's not. Because Jesus said it would happen. And it happened just as he said. And so we can look forward to the fact that the promise of his coming is sure. As sure as that, as sure as your salvation. But at the heart of it, be not troubled. Endure to the end the tribulation that the Lord puts before you and delivers you to for your sake and for his sake and for his kingdom's sake. And be assured that this world is not our home. We are just aliens. We are just immigrants passing through. But there is a world that is coming. 
Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you have given us enough information to know hope for the future. And Lord, whether we can tangibly see that hope today in the circumstances of our lives, we know that there is a blessed hope that regardless of the path that you have chosen for us to walk in this world, we are on a journey with a destination that is phenomenal, that is all that we could imagine or think and exponentially more. Lord, I pray that you would put and plant firmly that hope in our hearts so that in each day as we face and hear about the wars and rumors of wars and as we face tribulation and as we consider the deceptions that are going on in this world that would seek to deceive us and already have deceived others whom we know and love. Lord, I pray the planting of that blessed hope would permeate our soul and our spirit so that we would not allow our hearts to be troubled, but that we would endure to the end. Lord, let us see these things with your perception, not ours. And now may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. May he make his face shine upon you, and grant you peace. May he lift up, lift up his countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life through Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and the one who is coming like the lightning flashes from the east to the west. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.